It wasn't always like this. For the longest time, I used to stay away from the kind of real death videos that kids can easily view on various Reddit forums. Meanwhile, God forbid your child wants to check out a graphic novel about the Holocaust at the school library, right? But yeah, I found them ghoulish and depressing, so I avoided them. But during the first couple weeks of 2022, I discovered that they really help at stabilizing my mood. And the less anxiety I have, the easier it is to accept that everything will not be all right. And that's okay, because that's just how it goes. You see, I don't get enjoyment out of them. I get, well, I, I get constant reminders as to why I shouldn't just eat. I'm reminded to appreciate the precious time I have conscious and above ground. I'm reminded to search out and appreciate the beauty in this ugly, ugly world, even in the mundane. I'm reminded as I watch a faceless man have his arms chopped off by cartel members or a woman drown in an icy river to the screams of her young children, that things can always be worse. And so I'll keep on trucking. I'll continue treating others as I wish to be treated, and in return, I'll continue to be left wanting. But that's okay, because one, it makes me feel better than everybody else, and two, I'll be too busy being grateful for remaining a mere background extra in the scariest, most disturbing horror film ever made, Life on Planet Earth. And should I find myself upgraded to being a star or featured player in this horror film? Let's say I catch a brick in the face during my morning commute due to some little kid tossing one from the freeway overpass, and footage of my hollowed-out face and sprawled-out corpse makes it onto the interwebs, accompanied by humorous comments from the anonymous living. Well, c'est la vie. It was nice while it lasted. Up until that moment, of course. Cut to black. Roll credits. Moving on from the real horror show we're living in to the fake ones that we watch for entertainment, there's a movie podcast I listen to, and it's called Trick or Treat Radio, and they mostly cover horror, but they'll also do other genres like sci-fi or fantasy, just to name a couple. They focus mostly on independent and lower-budgeted films, as they like the champion, the little guy. But they'll also review bigger movies here and there. They are also not held to current releases, and so they'll occasionally cover films from the past. Sometimes they can be a year old, sometimes they can be decades ago. The show is currently hosted by three gentlemen who go by the monikers Johnny Wolfenstein, Ares God of War, and Michael Ravenshadow. And episodes usually run from two and a half to three hours. The show is broken into three parts. The first part is not unlike an old school Howard Stern show episode, with the hosts mostly bullshitting about their everyday lives while busting each other's balls. The middle part is the bulk of the show, where they discuss that week's film, or films, with each host rating the film either a trick, which is bad, or a treat, which is good. And then the last part has them winding down while reading emails and listening to voicemails. At the end of the year, they have a special episode where they each list their top 13 films from all the movies they covered during the last 12 months. I really enjoy the show, and have even appeared a couple times as part of their Patreon Takeover episodes where they invite patrons to program and co-host an episode. For 2021, I thought it would be fun to participate by watching along with the show. So week by week, I'd watch what they watched. And I'd write up my thoughts on each film and post my thoughts on social media. Then I would listen to the episode and find out how my thoughts compared with theirs. I really enjoyed the experience. It was not unlike, say, being part of a book club, only they didn't even know they were in a book club. I also compiled my own top 13 list, and I certainly wasn't going to keep it to myself. So I'm sharing it here with the rest of you. My criteria for the choices on my list were simple. If it was reviewed between January and December during that year, and it was new to me, it was eligible. I disqualified my Patreon takeover films, as well as the Monsterpiece Theater viewings, where Patreon listeners would get together with the hosts to do a special episode to discuss a particular movie. Anyway, here's my top 13 list of movies that were covered on the Trick or Treat radio podcast in 2021. Number 13, The Maid. 2020, directed by Lee Thongcam. This Thai film is about a young woman named Joy who starts a new job as a maid for a wealthy family. You know, the kind with a miserable husband, a miserable wife, and a little daughter who gets little to no attention. Along the way, Joy realizes that the previous maid might have quit for very understandable and frightening reasons. During the first half, I found this movie to be okay, and I thought I knew where it was going, but... 
Then I was emotionally sucker-punched by a revelation at the midpoint. From that moment on, what started as a decent haunted house flick turned into a different kind of genre, and it became a better and more entertaining experience for it. Leading up to a 30-minute long climax that got me so worked up, I actually started yelling at one of the characters just as my DoorDash order arrived. The poor girl thought I was calling her a fucking cunt. Can you believe it? Number 12, Bloody Hell, 2020, directed by Alistair Grierson. A dude named Rex decides to escape his terrible life in Boise, Idaho by taking a sudden random trip to Helsinki, Finland, only to find that he succeeded in jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire. To say more would be spoiling the fun and discovering what happens to the poor schmuck. The style of the film is very chaotic and frantic, but not in some annoying wannabe cool extreme sort of way. It comes off very methodical, and it works. The tone reminded me of something like Ready or Not with Samara Weaving, in that it's a dark comedy with plenty of laughs and blood. Also, I think lead actor Ben O'Toole is like Samara Weaving in that they're both secret Australians. Actually, I think this entire movie is secretly Australian. It's like, it's like they know that we still haven't forgiven them for Crocodile Dundee, and so they feel they have to be sneaky about it. They got you. Oh, 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 oh. I have no fucking idea! I have no idea! Let me ask you something. Why'd you pick Finland? Huh? Of all the fucking places on the planet, why Finland? Why did you choose fucking Finland? Fuck! Fuck! <laughs> No. <laughs> okay, you know what? If you're gonna insist on asking that question, I suggest you apply it to figuring out how to undo those knots and get the fuck out of here. Because guess what, pal? Hey, you're here. And it doesn't matter how. It doesn't matter why you are here. Welcome to paradise. <sighs> Number 11, Synchronic, 2019. Directed by Aaron Moorhead and Justin Benson. Anthony Mackie and Jamie Dornan play paramedics in New Orleans, and they're both trying to make heads or tails out of the rash of junkie overdoses on a new drug called, wait for it, Synchronic, the kind of narcotic that would feel right at home alongside Cynadrugs like Nuke and Slow Mo. This moody and stylish sci-fi flick is very intriguing and features great chemistry between the two leads. The film also pulls a neat trick in starting off as serious then turning into something more fun at about the halfway point. It also ends at the perfect moment, a skill that even seasoned filmmakers often lack. So kudos to these relative newcomers behind this film. I'd wish the two directors luck in their future endeavors, except they're working on Marvel stuff for Disney Plus now, so fuck them. Dispatch Unit 101 requesting backup to Ninth Street Hotel. We've got a snake bite and an unknown possible OD. A snake on the second floor of a fucking hotel. Remember that snake bite we ran out on in the boonies and the shell met? Hey, miss, you in a Pentecostal religion? Some dude walking around with a fucking copperhead. He thinks God's gonna I ain't no fucking copperhead. Well, what is it, bro? I mean, the punctures, they're not the right size. And her response to the venom? I want to be a fucking... Eastern Diamondback Rattler? There hasn't been an Eastern Diamondback scene in Louisiana in decades. Number 10, The Night House, 2020, directed by David Bruckner. Rebecca Hall plays Beth, a teacher grieving over the suicide of her husband. Soon she begins to hear strange sounds and see odd sights, and they are all connected to his death. 
On the surface, this is an above-average mystery-slash-ghost story that suffers from an over-reliance on jump scares, but below the surface, this is an excellent drama about loss, the grief that follows, and the inability to deal with either. This is made even stronger by Hall's outstanding performance as Beth, a woman who puts up a tough, sardonic front while trying to mask the pain she's going through. Hall definitely deserved an Oscar nomination for her work here, which is why she didn't get one. Who is this? Owen? I can't hear you. I can't. Number nine, Malignant, 2021, directed by James Wan. A woman begins to have strange visions of people being brutally murdered and soon finds out that not only are these murders real, but that she and the killer are somehow connected. Director James Wan gives in to his inner, overly caffeinated 14-year-old self with this very entertaining mix of Dario Argento, Stephen King, 80s Italian horror flicks, and 90s American slasher movies. Some might be put off by its gleeful, unapologetic wackiness, but yours truly was in Good Time City, Population Me. But come on, Wan, why did you have to cast your wife in a supporting role? Crikey! No, mate. My Shale is very talented, mate. She co-produced the movie with me. Koalas and Outback Steakhouse and Shrimp sure, on... Sure, Jimmy. I don't know why you're wasting your time jawing at me when I know you're already late for your weekly meeting at the Good Hollywood Husbands Club. Yeah, that's right. I've seen you guys all hanging out together. You, Rob Zombie, Judd Apatow, and David Mamet. All of you holding your wife's purse. I never said I could do an Australian accent. Who are you? Facing, I'm only in your head. I don't know what you're talking about. You let them tell you I wasn't real. That I was just a voice, and you believed them. Now, I'm going to make them pay for what they did. One by one. Give her a <laughs> See, deep down. Please stop. Please. Oh, we're just getting started. Number eight, The Vigil. 2019, directed by Keith Thomas. Yaakov, a former member of the Orthodox Jewish religion, has been convinced by his mentor to be the shomer for a recently deceased man. What that means is that he's to sit vigil overnight, praying for the dearly departed, protecting him from evil. What follows is a long night full of evil spirits who don't take no for an answer. Mostly set in one darkly lit room, this slow burn old school creeper can be at times borderline monotonous, but it's done with purpose. And when those scares hit, they hit hard. It helps that I genuinely cared about the main character. So big props to Dave Davis's Yakov, who really does get run through the ringer, both physically and emotionally. This film was originally placed at number 10, but I was able to Jew it down to number 8. Who is this man? I thought you were getting a Schäumer. I got some Schäumer, do not know. No. It is a Schäumer, Schäumer. Again, do Moshe Kellner, Chaim Sturman. He won't work. I don't know if it's a schwer drug, it's a very schwer, but... He needs to leave now. You have to leave now. The number seven. Number seven, The Medium, 2021, directed by Banjong Pisanathanakun. 
This one's a fake documentary that follows a local shaman in Thailand. Her name is Nim, and when she was a young woman, she was possessed by a goddess, granting her the supernatural ability to heal people. But during a family visit, Nim begins to notice strange behavior from her niece that echoes the behavior she had pre-possession. Could this mean that the niece is next in line in the shaman business? A canny riff on The Exorcist, The Blair Witch Project, Poltergeist, and Paranormal Activity, this movie is not unlike what my girlfriends have said about spending the night with me. Long, slow, increasingly disturbing, and when it was over, I didn't want to go through it again. Number six, Censor, 2021, directed by Prano Bailey Bond. Set in the United Kingdom during the 1980s video nasty period, this film focuses on Enid, whose government job is to watch horror films and then tell the filmmakers what parts to cut out in order to make their work safe for the general public. Her flavorless life gets an unwelcome spicing up when the news comes out that a man murdered his family after watching a film that she had approved for release. This very effective mix of mystery and psychological horror not only convincingly recreates the 1980s in its settings, but in its representations of the kind of lower-tiered horror films that were often censored or outright banned in the UK during that time. I think this would sit nicely alongside David Cronenberg's Videodrome in that very narrow video store shelf labeled Mind-Fucking Flicks about mind-fucking VHS tapes. Why do you think he can't remember? Who? The amnesiac killer. Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, why wouldn't he remember? God, it's hard to... It could be basic trauma. Brain, it sort of shuts it out. Could have had a bang on the head even, or... But it, it makes me think my psychotherapy days would talk about how people construct stories to cope. You'd be surprised what the human brain can edit out when it can't handle the truth. Look, you're good at your job, Enid. Don't let what's going on out there get to you. Number five, St. Maud, 2019, directed by Rose Glass. Maud, a hyper-religious hospice nurse, takes the assignment of caring for Amanda, a terminally ill dance choreographer. As this short, sad, and scary character study continues, we find that Maud's beliefs are less about faith and more of a fanatical certainty. The way this portrays the character of Maud, I'd place this in the subgenre of God's Lonely Man, although in this case it would be God's Lonely Woman, as it puts to mind similarly structured films like Taxi Driver and First Reformed. This was an A24 release, but I like to imagine an alternate universe where Troma got a hold of it and they distributed it and they changed the title to Jesus Freak Nurse or something like that. Anyway, it's a great film and Morpheth Clark is stellar in the title role. Nothing feels real anymore. Ever since I moved back here, I keep thinking about that last moment and wondering what it will be like. What will I be looking at? Will there be anyone else there? And then what? Tell me I'm wrong. There's more. And not just afterwards, see? He's everywhere. He's 
sees you, he won't let you fall. Number four, The Empty Man, 2020, directed by David Pryor. A widowed ex-cop named James is on the search for the missing daughter of a family friend. Along the way, he learns of the legend of The Empty Man. If you blow into an empty bottle on a bridge, he is summoned. And three days later, you are irreversibly and permanently fucked. Figuratively fucked, I mean, not literally. Anyway, guess what the fuck James ends up blowing? This is a deliberately paced work of detective fiction with a strong supernatural bent and plenty of creepy atmosphere, reminiscent of something like the 1987 film Angel Heart or even 1973's The Wicker Man, you know, the non-cage, non-bee version. It features a strong lead performance by James Badge Dale, and I was surprised to see Nietzschean and Schopenhauer-esque concepts and beliefs being thrown about. I did kind of groan upon seeing a high school called Jacques Derrida High School, but hey, I still appreciated the effort. There is no struggle because there are no distinctions. To say that you are wrong or I am right is to divide us. Therefore, we deny there is such a thing as right or wrong. These are exclusionary constructs designed to foster the illusion of separateness. There is no such thing as disunity. There is only the great binding nothingness of things. At one time we were one. We will all be one again. Number three, Vicious Fun, 2020, directed by Corey Callahan. And Werewolves Within, 2021, directed by Josh Rubin. I'm cheating here and putting two movies in the same spot, but that's because I feel they were both equally fun viewings and they'd make a cool horror comedy double feature. Vicious Fun takes place in the 80s and follows Joel, a horror magazine writer, who accidentally ends up sitting in at a support group meeting for serial killers. This one is a borderline cartoon with just the right amount of blood and goofiness. It's very funny, and it's one of the few films I've watched during the pandemic that I wish I could have seen in a packed theater because I think this would play great with an audience. Mike was saying something really uh, interesting about what you're hunting for in life, if you want to finish that thought yeah, up. I just want to be in the moment. Could be at an old cabin, summer camp upstate. Huh. Sorority house. That's weird. Then things get fuzzy for me. All I remember is screaming. Then there's silence. You know? Can you please describe your disposal methods? How do you conceal your actions from people? Fucking robot. I don't know, man. I don't do my dishes half the time. You think I'm going to clean up a blood-drenched campsite? What do you do with the bodies? I have a 17-point plan that involves several stages of operation. Oh, wake me up when you're done. Werewolves Within is about the new forest ranger in town, Finn, and his attempts to keep everybody safe and sane during a rash of attacks that appear to be the work of a werewolf. Populated by wacky characters, who I found also entertaining, this light-hearted movie could have forgotten about the werewolf, and I still would have found this to be a very good time. It also features a very 90s-tastic bar that I wish existed in my neighborhood. I would have become an alcoholic for sure, but man, what better way to pickle your liver than to have Ace of Base blaring in your ears while doing so? Uh, out of curiosity, who is packing? I am, yes sir, America. Shh. Well, we're packing, dog. Wow. I have Dave's hunting rifle, if that would be helpful. Oh, gosh, I almost forgot. Um, I got, uh, it's teensy, it's just a little, okay. it's a little, it's first gun. Excuse you. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, I think we should keep a, a gun in every room, you know, just to be safe. Yo, hold up! This dude Emerson wants to come down off his mountain maniac ass and eat our asses and fuck our skulls. Guess what? It's not gonna happen tonight because, pam pam, I'm up in this shit. Yeah, where my gun goes, I goes. Same. And I'm sleeping with my wife. Unless someone prefers that my gun stays in someone else's room. Cecily, do you have protection? Or? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, one more time, raise your hand if you have a gun. It's tiny, it's, it's purse. Number two, Come True, 2020, directed by Anthony Scott Burns. 
Teenage runaway Sarah takes part in a sleep study where her dreams will be recorded and what follows is sleep paralysis and visions of dark figures with glowing eyes. This is less of a horror film and more of a mood piece, but man, what mood! It's an incredibly stylish film with a resting use of sound and visuals. I love the way this film looked, with its very sharp angles, precise framing, and colored lighting. And the music by Electric Youth and Pilot Priest is retro synth heaven. There's even great use of a song from the soundtrack to Michael Mann's Manhunter. I mean, that's the kind of movie we're talking about. This is also one of the few films I've seen that comes close to capturing the feel of a dream. Specifically, the kind of bad, intangible dreams I've had where I'm not sure what I just slept through, but it left me feeling unsettled upon waking up. That's how Come True felt to me. Stage one. The eyes close. A reduction in activity between wakefulness. The patient can be awakened without difficulty, but if woken at this stage, the person will not feel as if they have slept. Many have a feeling of falling during the first five to ten minutes of sleep, which can cause a sudden muscle contraction called hypnic myoclonia. Very good, Lyle. Now, watch the EEG and the EOG. Some of them are entering stage two. We'll now see some peaks and valleys, indicating periods of muscle tone and muscle relaxation. And now for my number one trick-or-treat radio film of 2021, Last Night in Soho, 2021, directed by Edgar Wright. Small-town girl Eloise moves to big-city London to study fashion design. She rents an old room that has clearly not been changed since the 1960s, which is fine with her because she's obsessed with the 60s. Soon, she begins to have way too lucid dreams about a girl from that decade named Sandy. And so Eloise begins to experience Sandy's life as she makes her way in the city as a nightclub singer. This all sounds pretty cool, except for the fact that Eloise's late mother suffered from mental illness. And so there's the possibility that these nocturnal visions that she's having are doing her some similar damage. I'll be honest, this one took a little while to grow on me, but once the plot kicked in, I was absolutely committed to this excellent psychological thriller. Even though he's best known for comic riffs on genre movies, Last Night in Soho is Edgar Wright's most serious film to date, putting the screws to both the main character and the viewer, with only the occasional moment of humor to break the tension. Considering the director and this premise, I expected a visually exciting movie with plenty of cool 60s Britpop tunes on the soundtrack, and that's what I got. But what surprised me was how much I cared for the characters of Eloise and Sandy. As written by Wright and Christy Wilson Cairns, and performed by Thomasine McKenzie and Anya Taylor-Joy, I found them painfully sympathetic and wanted them to come out okay at the end of their journeys. I plan to watch this again soon, but I feel this one ties with Hot Fuzz as my absolute favorite film from this director. Well, hello there. The bartender said I should get to know the handsome fella standing next to Silla Black. You should. And you are? The next. Silla Black. Are you now? Well, you know she started out as a coach at girl. You willing to work your way up? Of course. What can I get you to drink? It's Sandy. And I'd love a Vespa. James, we'd love a Vespa. So what do you do, Sandy? Well, I sing, of course. How's your dancing? Care for a demonstration. Now, as the Trick or Treat Radio Boys also gave out their honorable mentions, I'll do the same. I have two honorable mentions. The first just barely missed the list at number 14, the 2021 film Titan by Julia Ducourneau. And it's an incredibly strange and original tale about a very odd duck who models at car shows. She's a chick, not a duck, you know what I mean. It starts out as one kind of movie and then turns into another, but my interest throughout was never less than 110%. It's certainly not for everyone because there's off-putting audaciousness involving body horror, uh, the unlikable lead character, the uneasy mix of dark comedy with genuinely emotional moments, but it definitely worked for me. 
The second honorable mention wasn't covered on the show, but it was recommended to listeners by former co-host Monster Zero. And that's the 1981 film Evil Speak, directed by Eric Weston and starring Clint Howard in what is basically a male version of Carrie. Except I think I prefer the climax of this film to Carrie's. We watch Howard's put-upon nerd get the full bully treatment by his classmates, but thankfully he's able to get back at them with the power of the Dark Lord Satan. And when he does, it is B-E-A beautiful. During this particular time, it seems more and more that the real world is lacking in justice, as the assholes in society keep getting away with things scot-free. And so, if it takes an otherwise cheesy movie like Evil Speak to feed my justice demon, so be it. Well, that covers my top 13 of Trick or Treat Radio movies of 2021. And because one bad turn deserves another... Here are the rest of the films covered that year on their podcast, uh, placed in order from best to worst. Here we go. I'm going to start with number 14. All right. Give me a second here. Here we go. 14, Titan. 15, Blast Broadcast. 16, Spare Parts. 17, Caveat. 18, Willy's Wonderland. 19, Promising Young Woman. 20, The Green Knight. 21, Wolf Guy. 22, Sons of Steel. 23, Candisha. 24, The Advent Calendar. 25, Army of the Dead. 26, Hunted. 27, The Boy Behind the Door. 28, VHS 94. 29, The Deep House. 30, Martyr's Lane. 31, In the Earth. 32, The Tunnel. 33, Knocking. 34, Sator. 35, Antlers. 36, The Banishing. 37, Two Heads Creek. 38, Raw Force. 39, The Stylist. 40, Jacob's Wife. 41, Coco D. Coco Day. 42, Lucky. 43, Sun. 44, The Queen of Black Magic, 45, Fried Berry, 46, Primal Rage, 47, The Spine of Night, 48, The Last Matinee, 49, Black Friday, 50, Sound of Violence, 51, The Dark and the Wicked, 52, Psycho Gorman, 53, Demonic, 54, Clapboard Jungle, 55, Dakra, 56, Skull of the Mask, 57, Honeydew. <sighs> there you have it. Here's to another year of movies. I intend to watch along with Trick or Treat Radio during 2022. I've already started, actually. We're about like a month into it. And who knows what awaits all of us. And in that spirit, here's to another year of uncertainty. And here's to the foolish hope, but sincere hope, in the high unlikeliness that when we make it to the end of this horror movie, there will be a post credit stinger. You know, something like the Avengers eating shawarma, but forever. This has been the Exiles from Contentment podcast, recorded live in front of an empty room. Exiles from Contentment has been brought to you by anger, paranoia, resentment, depression, low self-esteem, and rally cigarettes. Now with less nicotine and less throat irritants. Remember, lady and gentlemen, if your cigarette tastes different, smoke rally. Episodes of this podcast can be downloaded at efcontentment.podbean.com. That's E as in EGADS. This asshole's podcast is terrible. F as in fuck this asshole's terrible podcast. Contentment as in something this asshole hasn't felt in a very long time. Dot pod as in podcast as in everybody's got their own goddamn podcast nowadays. And B as in what the Mexican-American host of this podcast probably eats every day. Am I right, real Americans? The Exiled from Contentment podcast can also be downloaded at exiledfromcontentment.blogspot.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as EF Contentment, all one word. Follow or friend us so we can then immediately have your tweets and posts muted in order for us to have a higher friend and follower count while pretending that we care about you. You can also email us at exiledfromcontentment at gmail.com. Until our next ramblings, this is Princess Sparkle for the Exiled from Contentment podcast saying take care and be well. <laughs>